Hey, how many of you remember back when you were in school and by raising your hand, you'd say, man, I really like the test. You know, I like when the teacher gave an exam. How many of you would? A couple people, weird people, all right? I mean, the overwhelming majority of us would go, no, I really didn't enjoy that, right? I don't know about you, my least favorite was a pop quiz. Remember the teacher sometimes would say, today, we're going to have a pop quiz. I never went, oh, goody, okay? But, but tests are important, right? I mean, tests help us to kind of evaluate and to see if we're progressing academically. Did you know the Bible says that life is a series of tests? Did you know that the Bible says, in fact, that life is one big test? Now, here's the good news. God doesn't give pop quizzes, okay? God tells us exactly what's going to be on the test. Uh, we could say that God gives an open book test, if you remember those days, right? He tells us exactly what's going to be on the test. Now, we don't know when the test of life will come, but we can know what the test will be. And as you and I go through life, it doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter your age, it doesn't matter your gender, you and I will face a test as it relates to our finances. Now, when it comes to tests, I, I only failed one test in school. And in all my years of school, I only remember failing one test, and I still remember it. And, and what I did is I failed it because I didn't turn the paper over and realize there were questions on the back of the sheet, okay? I had only completed the front part, and I'd gotten most of them right, but I didn't turn the paper over and see there were questions on the back. And so as a result, I didn't answer any of those questions, and so I failed the test. It's the only test in all my years that I remember I failed that test. And when it comes to our subject today, many churches... And many pastors treat it kind of like I did that test. They only look at part of it. They only look at half of it, and as a result, they fail the test. Now, if you've been coming to Fincastle Baptist for any length of time, I hope you know that, that I love you. I hope you know that I want something for you rather than something from you. And you're in church today, whether it's your first Sunday in a long time, whether it's your first time here, I believe you want to hear a word from God. I, I believe you want to hear from God. And I also believe that you want a pastor who will preach to you all the Bible, even, even the hard parts. And this is a series I didn't want to preach because this subject is so hard because it's so personal. It really kind of reveals where we are in our Christian walk. And, and can I just confess to you this morning my fear? I'm fearful that, that I'll be misunderstood. I'm fearful that you won't really hear my heart. I'm fearful that You'll just kind of roll your eyes and think, well, there he goes again. Or you'll think I'm trying to guilt you or manipulate you. This is a series I didn't want to teach, but I really need to. You know why I really need to? Because if I knew the answer to something that could help you, if I knew the answer to something that would reduce the stress in your life, that would help improve your health, uh, that would reduce the conflict in your marriage, that would bring you joy, if I knew that answer but didn't share it with you, wouldn't you be angry at me? I mean, wouldn't I be negligent if I didn't share with you the answer to what so many of us struggle with and worry about? And when it comes to God's perspective on your finances. Well, why are we teaching this, Pastor Kevin, if you really don't want to? Again, because I want something for you, not something from you, and because there will be a test. And as your pastor, I want you to not just pass the test, I, I want you to get an A plus, okay? And Jesus spoke about this stuff a lot. A matter of fact, two thirds of his parables were about stewardship, Amen. about money, about finances. As a matter of fact, Jesus spoke on that subject more than he did heaven and hell and prayer combined. And in Matthew chapter 6, if you haven't done so, go ahead and open your Bible to Matthew chapter 6. We have Jesus' most famous sermon. 
Even if you don't know anything about the Bible, you've probably heard of what's called the Sermon on the Mount. And it's found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Now, when we come to Matthew chapter 6, right in the middle of this sermon, at the first part of the passage, Jesus speaks on how to pray. It's what we normally call the Lord's Prayer. And at the end of chapter 6, he speaks on, the, on, on how to deal with worry. And I love preaching on those things. I love when we study those things. Because here's what I know. When we open the Word of God, and when it says something practically like how to deal with worry, it helps you, it encourages you, it blesses you. You, you and I, we get something out of it. And when we learn on how to pray so my prayers get higher in the ceiling, it encourages us. But right in the middle of those two things, in verses 19, he speaks on the subject of treasure. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. And as always, I'm reading from the New International 1984 version of God's Word. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, there's four tests as we go through life as it relates to finances we see right in this passage. The first one, number one on your handout is what I call the durability test. The durability test. How long will it last? Now, note uh, the word Jesus uses here is treasures. What do you treasure? I mean, Americans were fascinated by treasure, right? From pirates to treasure maps to medical de- metal detectors at the beach. We all get excited about discovering some new treasure. Do you know the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4 that if you're a Christian, you have some treasure? You might not have a lot of cash. You might not have a lot of Federal Reserve notes, but we all have some things we treasure. Some of you maybe would say, I really treasure my health. Maybe you just, as we heard in those testimonies, went through a difficult time. Physically, you're in remission. You say, I treasure my health. Some people would say, man, I treasure life itself. Or you might even say, I really treasure my relationship with God. Or maybe you've got some antique. Something's been passed down to you by your family members. You say, you know, I really treasure that thing. Or maybe photographs of past events. And you say, I treasure them. Or, or, you know, we say we treasure our family. Well, where, not what, But where is my treasure is the key question Jesus is teaching here. Where your treasure is, is far more important than what is your treasure. Again, not everybody has a lot of cash, but we all have things that we treasure. Now, don't misunderstand, because there's a lot of misunderstanding here about this passage. Jesus is not saying it's wrong to have a lot of treasure. No. The Bible does not say money is evil. No. There's many wealthy believers in Scripture. Jesus is teaching where my treasure is is more important than what my treasure is, and there will be a test. So to pass the test on your handout, he says, have an eternal perspective. Stop living for just today. Now, this command is what's called in the present tense. It literally means stop storing up. Or stop doing what most of us are naturally inclined to do. Jesus knew that as humans, our inborn desire is to accumulate things. And what Jesus is saying is stop it. You ever heard of Nike, just do it? Jesus is saying just don't do it. Now again, this does not mean we should not have material possessions. It does not mean we should not own property. It does not mean we should not save for the future. No, the key is two words for yourselves. You see that in verse 19? Do not store up for yourselves. Jesus is saying have an eternal perspective. Why? A, earthly treasures are very insecure. And he says there are a couple of things that can happen to him. Verse 19, they, de- they can decay. Remember, in ancient times, wealth was measured a lot by clothing. 
And a lot of clothing were made out of wool. And it doesn't matter how good the clothing were, moss would come in and sometimes they would eat through the garment. In addition to that, metal was very valuable and wealth was measured in part by it. But rust would corrode and consume things. Not only can they decay, but they can disappear. Thieves can break in and steal. During this time, remember, there were a lot of banks. So people would hide their valuables in a wall or they'd bury them out in the yard. And thieves would come and literally dig up the stuff in their yard or break down their wall. Matter of fact, I still remember. I still remember my grandfather. He was raised during the Depression. And I still remember when he was getting a little older, he said to me one time, he said to me and my dad, if something ever happens to me, I want you to take a shovel, I want you to go out under the chicken coop, I want you to dig under the chicken coop. And then he said to me, boy, then I want you to go behind the barn and I want you to dig behind the barn. So, you know, a few years went by and granddaddy passed on. And so we remembered that. So there I am. I still remember as a teenager getting my shovel, going out on the chicken coop. I start digging. I'm thinking, Granddaddy's up there just laughing at us in heaven. Here we are digging under the chicken coop, right? And I'm digging under the until clink. And there he had buried in mason jars all his savings. He didn't trust banks. So then I ran to the back of the barn, all right? Started digging there. Sure enough, clank, there it was. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Now, by contrast, our, earth, our heavenly treasures are secure. First Peter says, we have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. It's kept in heaven for us. I like to say it this way. Our treasures in heaven are protected and insured, not by the FDIC, but by the G-O-D, okay? There are only two things that are going to last forever, the word of God and people. So Jesus is saying invest in eternal things. Whatever it is, how long will it last? Anything but the word and God or people are going to disacay, they're going to decay or disappear. All the stuff of life, all the homes, the clothes, the cars, the cash, the jobs, the things will all pass away. So since only the word of God or people are eternal, the best investment I can make is to give financially to connect the word of God with people. That's why we ask people to give. First of all, out of obedience. Secondly, to make a difference, to see lives change for eternity. Why? Money will buy a bed, but not sleep. Money will buy food, but not satisfaction. Money will buy books, but not brains. Money will buy medicine, but not health. Money will buy a house, but not a home. Money will buy fun, but not happiness. Money will buy religion, but not salvation. Money will buy you a passport to anywhere, but heaven. He's saying there's the durability test. And then verse 21, look what he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Number two, there's the heart test. Now note what Jesus does not say, because a lot of people read this backwards. See, we think that Jesus is saying, if my heart is right with God, if I really love God, if I'm really grateful for all he's done, then I'll give my treasure to God, then I'll tithe, then I'll give to missions and the building fund. That's not what Jesus says. He says just the opposite. He says, my heart will follow my treasure. Wherever I put my treasure, my heart will follow. If I choose to store up my treasure on earth, my heart will be so focused on earthly things that it will tend to drift away from God. But if I store up my treasure in heaven, I'll end up becoming excited about the things of heaven and growing closer to God. To put it plainly, Jesus is saying my heart follows my money, but that's normally not how we think. We tend to think our money follows our heart. If my heart is right, I'll spend my money wisely, but that's not the way it works because on your handout to pass the test, you've got to realize your heart follows. It always follows. People say, well, I'm just following my heart. Don't do that. Why? Jeremiah 17 says the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Matthew would say in Matthew 15 that out of the heart comes all kind of evil thoughts and actions. People say, well, I'm just trusting my gut. Don't do that. Trust God. You don't follow your heart, you 
lead your heart because the heart of the issue is an issue of your heart. Whatever I invest my time, my energy, my money is becomes important to me. And too many of us spend all our time, money, energy on things of this world. We invest in everything of today and our heart is tied to the present. It, the same way in our relationships, right? If you're married and you kind of feel like that you're falling out of love with him or her, it's not time to seal off your heart and live as strangers under one roof. It, it's not time to pursue some tantalizing affair that makes you young again. It's not time to call the divorce attorney. Instead, you start investing your most valuable resource, your treasure into your spouse. You start spoiling your spouse. You start praying for your spouse. You start serving your spouse. Why? Why? You, where you invest your treasure, your heart follows, and before long, you will fall in love all over again. It's not an issue, A, of whether, it's an issue of where. We all have some treasure. Where am I going to put it? B, because where I invest is more important than how much. Do you understand? Whatever I invest my time, effort, and energy in becomes important to me. If I invest my money into a sports car, I'm going to do everything I can to look that, have that baby look sweet. If I'm going to invest my money into some stock, I'm always going to check that stock and see how it's doing. If I invest my time and money in some rental property, I'm going to try to keep it maintained. If I sacrificially invest my time, energy, thoughts, and money in my marriage, I'll be motivated to keep working on it and it will rekindle my love. The same thing works in my relationship with God. When I invest in his purposes, when I take the next step, he promises me more contentment. He promises me peace because whatever Jesus says I put my treasure in, that is where your heart will be. And then thirdly, there's the eye test. Look what he says in verse 22, for the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. What's Jesus saying? Where's my focus? See, most people can't see the treasure God has given them because they have eye problems. God is saying, focus on me. Focus on spiritual things. If I were to ask you, how many of you have a financial goal? I mean, you got a dream, you got a plan, you want to own a home one day, you want to pay off debt, you want to save for retirement, we'd all say. What about a financial goal for your family, for your kids? You want to save for your kid's wedding one day, save for college, or maybe if they're younger, give them allowance so they can earn, ba learn basic money management principles, or maybe you want to leave them an inheritance one day. We, we'd all say we have that, but what about a spiritual goal? Do you have a spiritual goal for your life? Do you have a spiritual goal for your kids, for, you, for your family? What's Jesus saying here? He's saying on your handout to pass this test, Focus on spiritual goals more than financial goals because A, materialism causes spiritual blindness. When the pursuit of money is my focus, my mind is always worried about it, I'm always thinking about it, it affects me spiritually. I lose sight of what's really important because verse 23, my eyes are bad. Now, they say confession's good for the soul, so here it is. I'm doing something today, whether you've realized it or not, that I have never done, ever, in over 30 years as a pastor. I'm doing something right now that I've never done in my 30 years as a pastor. And that is, I'm preaching from an iPad. <laughs> Let me tell you why I'm doing that. Because I've been having great difficulty over the last few weeks reading my own sermon notes. I went out and bought the biggest giant print Bible they sell, and sometimes I have a hard time reading the text. Now, I know what you're thinking. I have my reading glasses, and I just, it's a me thing. I don't want to be that preacher, okay? All right? And besides that, these help me see this, but then you all look kind of fuzzy out there, all right? 
And, and so it's a me thing. I, I hadn't worn my glasses. And so Thomas, our media guy, said, I can help you. You just need to get an iPad. Plus, he's trying to get me to be one of those cool pastors, all right? And so he said, we'll get you an iPad. So they got me an iPad. The problem was it wasn't big enough. So I don't know if you noticed, this is the biggest iPad they sell. And you can pinch the words and make it big. It's awesome, okay? And, and so I've been doing this on Wednesday nights because, you know, I had to kind of get used to it, all right? I've been teaching the last few Wednesday nights with it, so I just kind of went with the iPad. Now, we got talking about this before the service with the praise team, and they just went like nuts. Like three of the guys in the praise team said, well, what you need to do, Pastor Kevin, is first of all, you need to change your pants. You need to get skinny jeans. Ain't going to happen, all right? I'm going to tell you right now. And then the other guy said, if you really want to be relevant, what you need to do, you need to get a shave, all right? You know one of those shaves? I don't know if you noticed the dude in the drum, you know. Even Landon's got that shave, you know. I mean, I used to be good looking like he was, all right? Get a shave. And then Landon had the audacity to say, you really, the mustache needs to go, brother, all right? <laughs> and I said to him, I've been trying to get rid of the mustache for years, but Miss Terry won't let me save the mustache because she's never seen me without a mustache. And besides that, she's worried I might look younger than her if I shave my mustache. There's not a chance of that happening, all right? So I'm just embracing my eyes as I'm getting a little older going bad. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about. As we go through life, the longer we're a Christian, if we're not careful, what we need is some contacts, and we need God's glasses, God's perspective. And so look at the verse on your handout. Look what he tells us. Just as you excel in everything, in speech, knowledge, and complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. There's, a matter of fact, seven benefits of becoming a generous person. Let's go through them real quick. Number one, giving makes me more like God. Right, the most famous verse in the Bible. God so loved the world, he did what? He gave, right? Number two, giving draws me closer to God. That's what he's teaching about this passage. Our focus, it draws me closer to God. Now, there's lots of ways to give. I give my time, I give my talent, I give my tithe, I give my offerings. The Bible is clear. 10% of all I produce, Leviticus 27, is the Lord's and it is holy. Matthew 23, Jesus said, yes, you should tithe. But keep in mind on your handout, there is a difference. Circle that word difference. There's a difference between a tithe, which is 10% of my income, and offerings, which is anything above my tithe. Uh, why do I do this? Well, Jesus told, the Bible tells us, Deuteronomy 14 on your handout, the purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your life. Number three, giving's the antidote to materialism. See, there's a popular lie in our culture that happiness can be purchased. You know, you've heard it, right? Life, liberty, and the purchase of happiness, okay? I mean, that's how most Americans live. It's this if and then. If I get, then I'll really be happy. You know, if that were true, the people with most stuff would be the most happy, and we know that's not the case. Giving breaks this American syndrome of more, more, more. It's an antidote. It reminds me, Deuteronomy 8, God gives me the ability to produce wealth. Number four, giving strengthens my faith. That's what he's just said, that verse. I want you to excel. Matter of fact, do you know it's the only time in the Bible God says, I dare you? It's the only time in the Bible God says, I dare you to become a generous person. I dare you to tithe. There's more promises in the Bible regarding giving than any other. And again, this is a hard subject. I, I want you to know my heart. I want something for you, not from you. If I could help reduce stress and anxiety in your life, wouldn't you want me to tell and teach that? It's right in the middle of Jesus' most famous sermon. Uh, Malachi 3, that famous verse, look at it. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the windows, floodgates of heaven, and pour out so much blessing you will not have room enough for it. See, he not only tells me to tithe, he tells me where to tithe, the storehouse. What's that? That's the church. I don't tithe to missions. I don't tithe to the building fund. 
That's why he caught tithes and offerings. Matter of fact, he would say in verse 8, before this verse, that if I don't do it, I am in effect robbing God, and none of us want to do that. Number five, giving is an investment for eternity. Jesus said, if you love me, obey me. That's what this whole passage is about. And number six, giving blesses me in return. A generous man will be blessed, Proverbs 22. Psalm 112, good will come to him who's generous. It was Calvin Coolidge who said, no man is ever honored for what he received in life. He's only honored for what he gave. And number seven, giving makes me happy. Every parent on Christmas morning knows this. Acts 20 says it this way. It's more blessed to give than to receive. You see, on your handout, you make a living by what you get, but you make a life by what you give. Look at verse 24. It's the last test. Don't miss it. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It is number four, what I call the master test. Who do I serve? Now, note what it does not say. It does not say you better not. It does not say it would be unwise. It does not say it'll be difficult. No, it says you cannot. You can't serve both God and money. So to pass the test, how will I pass this test? On your handout, I've got to follow God's money management plan. That's what Luke Luke 16 is about. We're going to talk about that next week. You see, I'm guessing none of us want to hate God. You're in church today, right? Nobody wants to hate God, but listen, according to this verse, And the way most of us live, the fact that we're so devoted, we're so worried about earning and spending and saving and worrying about money, he's saying, A, loving God and money are mutually exclusive. I find it interesting that the author of this book we're studying is Matthew. Now, I don't know if you know his story. Remember, Matthew, before he met Jesus, was a tax collector. Now, tax collecting in that day was different than today. See, in that day, the Roman government would say, I want so much from each person, but then the tax collector was free to charge whatever he wanted, and whatever extra he charged was his salary. You can see how this worked, right? So it was a good deal to be a tax collector, okay? And tax collectors were hated. They were cooking the books, right? I mean, they were thieves, right? And so this guy, Matthew, he used to be called Levi. Guess what? He meets Jesus. Jesus transforms his life. And then he says, I'm going to start paying back everybody I've been ripping off all these years. Well, all his tax collector buddies, they don't like this. They're like, man, don't be doing that. And then... All the Christians didn't trust him and they were skeptical that he really met Jesus because he'd been ripping them off for years. Kind of reminds me about a guy who's been in the news a lot recently. I don't know if you've heard about this story. There was this guy. He's a famous rapper. His name is Kanye West. And he was married, he is married to Kim Kardashian. That's all you need to know right there, all right? I mean, this is not a good dude, okay? I mean, some of his lyrics from his songs were way across the line. I mean, terrible lyrics, terrible dude. Well, lo and behold, good old Kanye gets invited to a very small church next to where he lived by a friend. So him and Kim and the kids load up, they go to church. It's just a church of a couple hundred people. Well, the pastor of that church does what he does to everybody who visits his church. He starts to follow up with them. So that pastor, not some famous pastor that you and I have heard about or has a TV ministry or anything like that, he goes over, visits them, and he leads Kanye West to faith in Jesus Christ. So as a result, Kanye starts to grow in his faith. Kanye starts to be discipled. The pastor meets with him every week. And as a result, Kanye's life starts to change. So his old buddies, just like Matthew, is like, dude, uh uh-uh, man, you're different. And now the people that should accept him, a bunch of Christians, are skeptical about what his angle is. 
We pray that God would change the lives of people with great influence, and God does it, and now we don't think God answered our own prayer. Now listen, so Kanye puts out a new album entitled Jesus is King, and the phrase Jesus is King becomes the most Googled phrase in the last two weeks, resulting in millions and millions of searches. Now, note the word is not God, you know, like some politician, you know, God bless America at the end of this. No, Jesus is king as a result. Now, listen, Kanye is like any other new believer. He needs to grow in his faith. We don't need to put him up on a pedestal. We don't need to go to him for theology or doctrine. He's a new believer trying to grow in his faith, trying to leave his old way of living behind. So he's put, and I am proud to report, I, I have not listened to Kanye West's new album but I did read the lyrics and they're right on theologically. It's amazing. You know what else? Kanye's telling everybody that Jesus is king. Guess what? Jesus is king. Jesus was king before Kanye West got saved and Jesus will be king after Kanye West goes to heaven. Why? Jesus is king. Remember when he hung on the cross? What's the sign they put above him? King. Now, they did it mocking. You know, he's king of the Jews. Little did they know. He's really king. And God can, if God can change Conray West, he can change you, brother. You think, why? You don't know what I've done. I've gone too far. Have you studied Matthew's history? Have you read Kanye West is history. If God can reach him, he can reach you. Why? The greatest treasure, number one, is knowing Jesus as personal Savior. Do you? Do you really know Jesus? Not just about him, but I mean, do you really know him? Do you have a relationship with him? Have you nailed down a commitment to him? If not, listen, friends, that's the first step. That's what you do first. That's where it begins. You come to know God. How do I do that? Just like you heard these stories. You come to the point where you say, God, I need you. I've done wrong. I've sinned. Forgive me. Come into my heart. Take me to heaven when I die. I believe. I believe you died. You were buried. You rose from the dead. God, I just know I need you. Have you ever done that? Have you, are you sure? If so, great. If not, today's your day. Today's your day. God's got you here. You're watching, you're tuned in today. God slowed you down enough to get your attention, to make sure that you know, that you know, that you know. You don't hope so, you don't think so. You're not pretty sure. You know, and then once you do know, and you've nailed it, and you've settled it, then Jesus asked us, number two, what grade will you receive on God's financial test? Some of us right now would say, God, I'm a solid C minus, and I need to progress in this area. Wherever you are, we always talk about taking the next step. Wherever you are with this test, and it's a test, and God told us, It's not a pop quiz. As you go through life, you're going to be tested with this. It doesn't matter who you are. We all face it. What grade would you give yourself? Because see, number three, as it relates to God's financial test, the real issue, number three, is one of trust. Do I really trust Jesus when he talks about storing up treasures in heaven?